British army in 2017 finds itself in uncharted territory. They've not been at war for three years. After controversial campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a political reluctance to put boots on the ground. Afghanistan has taken a horrendous toll on our regiment. Absolutely horrendous. You'll struggle to find anyone who hasn't lost a friend. There's also widespread opposition to military intervention. The army's budgets are under increasing pressure. They could go and manoeuvre without firing ammunition. It saves you two million of the 3.8 that you hope to save. You know, the British Army is smaller than it's been probably since Cromwell's day. And I would want to look myself very closely in the mirror if I felt that there was a risk of the army being sent to do something that it wasn't properly prepared to do. But now, with the rise of the so-called Islamic State, the threat of a new Cold War in Eastern Europe, and famine and conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, the British Army have to play a new role in a deeply unstable world. How many patients do you usually see a day? 700 to 800. Filmed over 18 months, this series takes us into the heart of the British Army. How many Russians are across the border? 100,000 odd? Yeah, a lot. Through the eyes of the rank and file, no one else has operated in Estonia before. This is completely different from Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. And the leaders. General, how are you? Good to see you. Very, Very nice, nice to see you too. We see the challenges of fighting wars when we are not at war. Days of going out fighting the enemy, such as ISIS, for reasons above our pay grade, that doesn't happen anymore. In this episode, the army returned to Iraq where they have a bloody history. We were just shocked, yeah. About three weeks ago, we met a bloke that was fighting us in Basra, and because his family got killed by the British, they decided to fight us. So I, can, I can see his side of the story as well. Now they're helping the Iraqis defeat so-called Islamic State. Since the Mosul battle started, how many vehicles have you managed to take damage from the front line, fix them and get them back up to the front line? As the battle for Mosul begins, we are with the regiments operating behind the front line. One of the Iraqis, his family was being held by Daesh, and they were threatening to hurt his family if he uh, didn't shoot one of us. One of the ways we look at it is to be charming to every single person that we meet and work with, but to always have a plan to kill them. Can the army face off their enemies, find lasting peace, and avoid being drawn into costly new wars? British soldiers from one rifles regiment are in northern Iraq. They have just weeks to train a group of Kurdish recruits to fight the so-called Islamic State, known locally as Daesh. Listen in, listen to me. 25-year-old Lieutenant Jamie Robertson is on his first overseas operation. Quite simply, the main aim is to train them to be able to defeat Dash. It's definitely a very different tour for a lot of people, and particularly a lot of the guys that have been to Afghanistan before. It's taken a while to adjust. Thanks very much, sir. We train to fight. That's our bread and butter, that's what we do. So to then take that and pass it on to someone else and let them do the fighting definitely was uh, strange, I think, initially for a lot of people. Garwan, ready. Hanzan, Farha, Usman. 
when the so-called Islamic State captured Mosul in 2014. Ibrahim Dayeb was a student. Now he's in charge of a new regiment called the Green Eagles. Many are civilians with little or no combat experience. Do you think the urban stuff in the buildings, is that more useful than some of the countryside rural stuff we're doing? This is probably the most likely formation you're going to use. The Green Eagles are part of the Kurdish Peshmerga, a mixture of Christians, Kurds, and other Iraqi minorities. So if you stand up, all groups that have been brutally targeted by the so-called Islamic State. Obviously, there's a lot of openings in an urban environment. If someone steps out of a machine gun, it can hurt a lot more people. They're not always a regular force that have been trained before. They're taxi drivers, they're local farmers that on the weekends have volunteered to come out and fight. They might have owned an AK for the last 30 years, but never been taught how to use it properly taking someone that's got absolutely no experience and knowing in five or ten weeks' time they're going to be going to the front line and they're going to be fighting and it's our responsibility to put them in the best head for it. Yeah, that, that is challenging. Let's keep the spacing like that. The Green Eagles need training, but no motivation to fight. It's, all the IDs are marked, so stop walking on glass and patrol like you normally would, OK? Damon. In 2014, the so-called Islamic State, IS, swept across Iraq, seizing a third of the country. An international coalition, including Britain, targeted their strongholds with airstrikes, weakening their grip. But IS still controlled the city of Mosul, home to one and a half million people. To defeat IS, Mosul must be liberated. would you mind telling us how he lost his family members? Was that, was that in the fighting? The headlines this morning. Iraqi forces have launched an offensive against fighters from the Islamic State group to recapture the city of Mosul. At first light, the advance on so-called Islamic State. Zero hour had finally come, bringing an offensive that could decide the fate of the extremists and ultimately of Iraq itself. Ya abna shabin al aziz, ya abna muhafazat, nayna wal ahibba. Qad dqat saat al intisar, wa btadat amiliyat tahrir al musul. With the battle for Mosul underway, General Jones, the deputy commander of an international coalition of 69 countries and the most senior British army officer in Iraq, is traveling to ensure the Kurdish Green Eagles will be ready to fight. All right, guys, great to see you. See you Thanks very much. Everything with Daesh is done in a calculated manner. As the Iraqi security forces advance towards Mosul, Daesh calls that uh, damage and destruction. And the oil wells have been burning ever since. They know that smoke reduces the effectiveness of our surveillance and our strikes. It makes our lives harder. 
in Mosul, I can absolutely guarantee that today there'll be beheadings going on. There'll be people being thrown into burning oil pits. You know, this is a brutal, brutal regime. Liberating Mosul is a vital stage in the defeat of Daesh in Iraq. The hard yards in retaking Mosul has been done by the Iraqi security forces. We're not doing the fighting. We're here to support them with advice, and then on the ground, provide them with air support and surveillance. Shake the battlefield, set the conditions for the Iraqis uh, when they attack, identifying enemy positions in advance and striking them. It might take a little longer than it might if we were doing it, um, but it lays the ground for a far more lasting solution, because they're the ones who've liberated their country. Uh, and I think that's, that's very powerful for the future. Come on, Jamie, how are you? All OK? Yeah, good, good to see you. Yeah, and you? What's happening? So what we've got, this is one of the platoons here, which is going through um, defence lessons. Yeah. They kind of go for a more medieval style of yeah. this is our Defend castle. The fort. Yeah, hold yeah, the walls absolutely. and um, absolutely. hunker in. And what they initially did was just line everyone on this berm. So we're trying to teach them that if you can stop them further ahead and yes. the last line, it's that buffer, it creates time, it creates space. Absolutely. And what level of experience have these guys got? Um, it's a big mixture. The role of the British Army is very different to the last time they were here. Yeah. When Allied forces overthrew Saddam Hussein in 2003, they were initially welcomed as liberators. But liberators quickly became occupiers, and the Iraqi population turned against them. 179 British soldiers were killed in action. Iraq has been torn apart by sectarian violence since, a situation IS has exploited. The British military, I think it's fair to say, would feel they've got some unfinished business. I think there was uh, probably a degree of frustration as to the outcome. Was it nested to the very best political strategy? That's for, for others to comment on. I guess what I would say is that because of the way this campaign has been fought, I would hope that the government of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces will have a kind of credibility, um, an authority that w wasn't there previously. Jamie, thank you very much. I will uh, I'll see you later on. Thank you. This new role for the British Army leaves them in an uncertain position against an enemy who has a hatred of the West. A week into the battle for Mosul, IS launched numerous attacks in towns across Iraq. One attack is in Al Anbar province, western Iraq. The region was once a base for Al Qaeda. Now it's a stronghold for IS. Two hundred and fifty British soldiers from Four Rifles Regiment have been sent here to protect a strategically important Iraqi airbase at Al Assad. The route we're going to take is we're just going to dismount. We're going to walk through the abandoned shoes all the way along, through the running track down by the cinema, and uh, and drop down into the IF Sec Four HQ. Baldy. That's clear, mate. That's us clear of you. Yes, yeah, so you can move forward if you want. During the last Iraq war, thousands of American troops were stationed at Al-Assad. They had a nickname called Camp Cupcake, because it had all the um, 
sort of all the luxuries that you get back home. So for the Americans, it was actually a, a really good posting, uh, but it's obviously not like that anymore. As you can see, there's an outdoor swimming pool. Up further down there, there's um, like a stadium with an athletics track. There's all sorts of stuff here, really. It would have been nice to have that now, especially in the summer with a swimming pool. The base covers 25 square miles. Its size makes it difficult to defend. The main thing for us is to keep vigilance, to not let yourself get lax and not let your guard down. Lance Corporal Steve Smith fought against the Taliban in Afghanistan. But the British Army's role here is very different. They can't leave the base or actively seek out the enemy. Once Mosul's done, the question we've really got to ask ourselves is what are uh, Daesh going to look, look at doing next? Are they going to look at coming, infiltrating more into this area? Are they going to become more of a small insurgency in different, in different towns? Salam alaikum. It's easy to identify a uniformed enemy, but the minute they stop becoming uniformed and start fitting in with a local population, that's when it's a, a trickier task. Before four rifles arrived, Al-Assad was under constant attack from IS. They infiltrated and, and I believe they sort of sort of moved around the buildings um, and that's why we're doing patrols like this is to monitor what to get used to what buildings are in use and then when buildings start getting used again we can start asking why. Hundreds of Iraqi National Army soldiers are stationed at Al-Assad. Their job is to cut the flow of IS fighters crossing the Syrian border 100 miles away and joining the fight in Mosul. The coalition has brought in heavy artillery and state-of-the-art surveillance equipment to protect the Iraqi army. Belfed weapon, four-arm bursts, uh, supposedly high caliber, so the only ones that could be a PKM or a Dushka, and five nine zero zero mils from Sang 3. Well, there's now no freedom of movement through that corridor from the south, from the north, anywhere down towards Baghdad or up towards Mosul without us being able to get eyes on it. The idea being that we now constrict them and then push them into a, a, single, a single location and push them back towards the Syrian border, clearing Iraq of, of all Daesh uh, activity and, and fighters. We're still in a hostile environment where anything can happen, so things can change, you know, in a, a snap of the fingers. So all the guys just need to be ready. General Jones oversees the coalition's strategy to liberate Mosul. OK, team. Hi, team. Who's, who's briefing? Seven weeks into the battle, Iraqi forces are now fighting inside the east of the city. Biggest progress of the day is uh, on the uh, Guar axis. Yeah. You had forces that were right here, had a foothold secured in the southeastern portion of, of Mosul. Any other developments that I need? So there, there's been a number of beep. It's seen about eight today. One was up on, on CTS forces. The others were focused on the advancing forces in the south. 
So that of advance the hospital had seven reboots against it? Yes, sir. vehicles they use for these assaults, brutal weapon. The Iraqi security forces are, are pretty terrified of them. Daesh's industry of war is on a very significant scale, uh, and it requires explosives on a very large scale. They're very well fabricated platforms, perfectly designed for the job they're there for, which is to get an explosive device at speed down in amongst the Iraqi security forces. IS have launched over 200 VB IED attacks in the first 51 days of the battle for Mosul, killing thousands of Iraqi soldiers. Unlike past campaigns, General Jones can't put coalition troops on the ground to solve the problem. He's flying to the Iraqi army forward operating base south of Mosul and must find another way to help stop the heavy death toll of Iraqi soldiers. I guess I understand better than most people the true cost of war. My father was uh, killed in the Falklands War, uh, commanding a parachute battalion uh, in the Battle of Goose Green, and was awarded the Victoria Cross for his troubles. I undoubtedly feel motivated by the values he stood for. The world's changed enormously since 1982, but I quite regularly in my professional career refer to him and in my mind what he might have done in a set of circumstances. Security forces as they press into Mosul are taking pretty heavy uh, attrition in terms of their vehicles. And as Dace throws suicide vehicle borne improvised explosive devices at them, a lot of the vehicles are getting damaged and, and destroyed. And if we're going to keep the Iraqis in the fight, we need to repair their vehicles, we need to get them fresh vehicles. And they'll just download here and then move, migrate the equipment over. And uh, the track vehicles all get worked on just right out in the open, sir. Very temporary. Yeah. A quarter of the Iraqi army's vehicles have now been destroyed by IS. General Jones fears the offensive to take back Mosul could be in serious trouble. Aha! General, how are you? Good to see you. Very nice to see you too. How are you? General Hassan al Maliki is in charge of logistic support for the Iraqi army in Mosul. How does a broken vehicle uh, get from the front line back to here? If a Humvee uh, needs a new tire, do you send the tire forward? Does the vehicle come back here? How, how does it work? <laughs> Since the Mosul battle started, how many vehicles have you managed to take damage from the front line back to Taji, fix them and get them back up to the front line? <laughs> That's the bit that we've got to try and work on, is, is see how we can get some of these battle-damaged vehicles back forward faster. The coalition has spent over $550 million arming and training the Iraqi army. But even General Jones cannot control how they choose to deploy their resources. You know, it had that air of um, almost being there for demonstration purposes. You know, so yeah, people were lined up um, uh, to kind of almost show us what great the work they were doing. But there was kind of no real evidence of work going on. Is that, is that fair? That's, that's kind of the way that Iraq is operating. There's less investment going on here than I thought there was. The next day, General Jones calls a crisis meeting with Iraqi and coalition generals. He must convince the Iraqis to improve their military planning. Very nice. Else the battle for Mosul could fail. I think the vehicles that we really want to focus on today 
are probably Humvees because I think those are the key, key vehicle for the fight for Mosul. We are now using vehicles that we were keeping for after the Battle of Mosul. So at the beginning of a battle, we move at the speed of the fighter, but very soon we start moving at the speed of logistics, and we're at that point right now. So we're very interested in what the plan is to recover the damaged vehicles, then repair them, and then return them. I think what we need to try and help you with is as the vehicles come back down, the ones that are really, really badly damaged, leave them to the back of the queue. We take the ones that are battle damaged, that can be fixed and can be got back into the fight in a, a, in a matter of days. Those are the ones where I would advise we should be putting our effort. The speed of logistics has to catch up to the speed of the fighter right now. And really the momentum in Mosul will depend on how quickly we can turn out, particularly Humvees, from the third and the fourth line. We always knew that Mosul would be a tough fight. It is a tough fight. I would say Daesh are fighting harder than they've ever fought before. And they're not giving up easily. What we've then got to try and do is help coach them, uh, help them refine their tactics, and then also look at how we keep the Iraqi security forces in the fight. Any military only succeeds because of its logistics, and we need to make sure the logistics, the sustainment is there so the Iraqis can uh, keep up the fight all the way through Mosul. Thank you very much, Shukram. Thank you very much. Uh, I, th I think reasonably positive. Small steps. You've had the intelligence that a uh, suspect or someone, a vehicle that needs to be searched, someone suspicious, is going to be passing through this location. All these stones, all these represent is a road. It don't need to make sure that all your uh, section, um, however many blokes it is, are not fixated on that vehicle because that could be just a come on and you could have enemy anywhere around this area here. On the ground in northern Iraq, IS's VB IEDs are striking fear into the Green Eagles. This is the, uh, the most dangerous threat that the Peshmerga face. They're invariably very difficult to destroy and incredibly effective and quite simple to make. And this one's a Ford F-150 truck. They just stick a load of armour plating on the front and then fill the back with explosives and then just drive head on into the Peshmerga with um, a guy in the front that's ready to give his life. This is quite a small one. We get asked a lot by the Pesh, how do we try and take these on. The main thing that we try and do, because as you can see, the armour on the front, this is where the whole focus is. So it's about making the vehicle turn to expose the softer rears. Always try and make chicanes that they have to manoeuvre around to expose the vulnerable points. But this really is what strikes fear into the Peshmerga the most, uh, and quite rightly so. It's a very crude, very effective tool uh, against them and hard to stop. British military tactics only go so far. IS has an army of volunteers ready to drive the VB IEDs. As part of their propaganda, they post the selection process online. That was genuine happiness that he gets to be the next suicide bomber. It's a hard mindset to try and understand. The best way to try and work out how someone fights to the counter is try and put yourself in their shoes. But obviously it's, a, it's very difficult from our point of view to try and get into that mindset. Dash have absolutely no regard for preservation of life and us in the British Army and the Peshmerga here uh, that's fundamental to everything we do. We're fighting to protect life. Kazan am daash na kabin, ani khwa na kabin esa kulo desan kulo zar kulo tarol bukana wa mana alia kujan. Ne an kujta na aqli akhraba. Ani 
همو 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 بو هر همو کرد دنیا یا چیتی که زور کنیم که شرکه Ibrahim and the Green Eagles will be sent to the front line in a matter of weeks. Can you raise your hand if you have uh, a weapon with you that you can bring to training tomorrow? The coalition has supplied the Peshmerga with guns and ammunition, but all resources are now being used inside Mosul. When we first started the training this week, about 80% of them had uh, an AK-47 with them, but that number has dropped off now. And what we found is that whichever member of the family needs it the most that day, because they go to the front line, they'll take that weapon with them. So we've gone from 80% weapons to about 20 to 30 now, which makes obviously training quite difficult. Itrăm foarte tare în Iago, cu toroc de Mosul, cu parastinul cu două cu toroc de Mosul. Chiar n-a cam bursă o bugare noua, n-a o malu ca sucare ca Khomanu, Sarhanu, Arzu, nu știu de The British Army is walking a political tightrope in helping both the Kurdish Peshmerga and the Iraqi National Army. The Kurds want Mosul to be part of an independent Kurdish state. Their plan is vehemently opposed by the Iraqi government. Do you ever fear to train all these different parts of Iraqi society that what could happen in the future uh, could be detrimental? Yeah, so, I mean, there's an argument that says um, liberating a town or city is the easy part. Easy being relative, you know, it's a tough fight, but, you know, you, you know what you've got to do. You've got to fight your way through the, the town and the city. Um, the greater challenge that the government of Iraq has is what follows. What the international community has got to help Baghdad with is after Daesh is defeated, how you draw society together, reconciling communities will, will, be, a, will be a great challenge. At Al-Assad, there have been fresh suicide attacks near the base. OK, so an update to the enemy picture. Significant events. So they've received two incidents of incoming. One coming from Haditha, which is approximately here, and another coming from Sagra. Again, what that's showing is Daesh will to continue fighting. They're willing to hold that ground and fight for that ground. Of note is two suicide bombers uh, that struck ISIL positions along Highway 19. Essentially, one of them was killed before he could detonate his vest, uh, and the other successfully detonated. Two friendly KIAs and two friendly wounded. A BDOC India 10 Alpha, uh, permission to enter friendly lines 2 by 11. 25 year old Lieutenant Pete Enriquez is observing a US Marine mortar team on the outer perimeter. In the last attack on Al-Assad, IS infiltrated the base, sneaking through the riverbeds. The Americans are taking offensive action to prevent another attack. goes to show how determined these people are uh, calling in five days on your belt buckle on your chest is I mean that's pretty grim we do a feral bit of crawling but I can't have possibly imagine doing it for five days by firing the mortars it sends that clear warning that yeah we know what you're up to we know what routes you take in it's a pretty aggressive deterrent to Daesh that if they want to try it again look we're here we're not afraid to shoot come get it if you really want sort of thing We signed up to the infantry or we signed up to the army because we wanted to pick up a rifle and get directly involved. 
having to answer the hard questions that the riflemen are asking because they're intelligent guys, having to put a positive spin on why they can't necessarily go out into the area outside of Al-Assad Air Base when they'd like to. So it is frustrating. It's an entirely different type of war fighting. Morning. Shalakum. Salam alaikum. Lance Corporal Smith and Rifleman Cocaine man checkpoints to search Iraqi civilians who work on the base. IS could recruit one of them to launch a suicide attack. We're just looking for any signs that would indicate someone is not normal. It's cold, isn't it? If someone isn't welcoming, there's got to be a reason why. The best way to look at it is someone that's about to have a fight, someone that wants to cause trouble. They don't tend to be part of the group. They tend to be just on that outside, being a bit itchy, being a bit twitchy, and basically getting ready to strike. Someone that's going to cause an insider threat is usually the same. Yes, it's the AND workers. It's so literally 5 through to 11. Over. They're just like people back home. They're friendly enough. I don't really have a problem with them. I like them, they've got good banter. Four rifles' role is a delicate balancing act. As long as we're here helping them, they're going to be on our side. The minute we stop helping them, or the minute we do something wrong, is when they'll switch and turn against us. At the end of the day, this is their country. We're coming here while we're trying to help them. You've got to show them respect and not treat them like second-class human beings. Just maybe the mistakes that other coalitions have made in the past. So that's a big emphasis, is treating them with the proper respect that they deserve. And if all else fails, just say Manchester United, they, they love it. Love it. All rifles are also training hundreds of soldiers from the Iraqi National Army at Al-Assad. In an area of widespread support for IS, this poses a higher level of threat than working with the Kurdish Peshmerga. Four rifles have intelligence that IS are trying to blackmail and turn some of the Iraqi soldiers against them. Okay, let's sell them a lekum. It's me, Woody. And today I'm going to teach you how to search routes. As a guardian angel, my particular job is to observe the Iraqis who are under training, um, just to make sure that they're not going to pose any threat to the British or coalition chaps who are delivering that training. We have three types of IEDs. Can anyone name them? Captain Tom Legg is the first line of defense against an insider threat. Probably the main threat we, uh, that we face from the Iraqis is actually one of them being coerced. So, for example, we've already had a, a situation where one of the Iraqis, his family was being held by Daesh, and they were threatening to hurt his family if he uh, didn't shoot one of us. At this point, the rear man will work his way searching up the road. He'll reach the marks, and he'll make his own mark. I don't think anyone likes the idea that somebody that you could have built up a relationship with could then harm you. But unfortunately, you've got to be aware of it. One of the ways we look at it is to be charming to every single person that we meet and work with, but to always have a plan to kill them. A further threat to four rivals is some of the Iraqi soldiers they are now training were their sworn enemies just a decade ago in the last Iraq war. <laughs> Rifleman Adam Barham still bears the scars of that conflict. Took a bit of a grenade coming the back of our wagon and it exploded and it hit me in the side of the head, up the side. I've got bits, I got a bit come out my nose the other day, I don't know if you can see it there. When I was in the gym the other day, it popped out my eye and got stuck in my nose. About three weeks ago, we met a bloke that was fighting us in Basel. So we started speaking to him and he said he was part of the, the army we were fighting down there. 
it's a bit weird knowing that he could have been the one shooting at us. And he said he was sorry for his, what he did, but he was just trying to defend his country. It's only because his family got killed by the British that he decided to fight us. So I can, I can see his side of the story as well. As neighborhoods are liberated in East Mosul, tens of thousands of civilians flee to refugee camps. Humanitarian planning for Mosul was based on a worst case scenario where the entire population of Mosul leaves their homes. The government of Iraq advice is to stay at home as long as it's safe to do so. Prime Minister Abadi, he's walking a kind of tightrope between the risks to the population as they stay in the city compared with the risks of a humanitarian catastrophe if they come out of the city. Many are ignoring the government's advice. General Jones worries the huge numbers could overwhelm the Iraqi army and divert resources away from the battle. I'd very much welcome your thoughts on the situation and where we might go next. <laughs> If we start getting very large numbers of people coming out of the, the city, uh, that will very quickly overwhelm the, uh, the ministry uh, organisations, but also the international community. Yeah, the eyes of the world is on Mosul. And the last thing we want is the fantastic liberation of the city by the Iraqi security forces to be compromised by the humanitarian situation. Thank you very much. Shukran. The Iraqi strategy of keeping residents in Mosul is an uneasy compromise for General Jones. It means the civilians are at risk from collateral damage. Shukran, very nice to see you. Yeah, no, it'd be really good to have a quick look. The, the Colonel seems a good guy. He is. What you can't do is just look for quick wins, you know, think that the retaking a town, a city, is the end of the story. It's absolutely not. You've, you've got to follow through on it. You know, if you look at Mosul, the last thing anybody wants, least of all Prime Minister Abadi, is for the, uh, the story of the liberation of Mosul to be overshadowed by some kind of humanitarian disaster. So there's a, there's a direct, direct correlation between victory on the battlefield and, and managing the uh, civilian population. One million civilians are still trapped inside Mosul. They are not just at risk of collateral damage. IS are holding thousands of them hostage and using them as human shields. They have executed nearly 3,000 who tried to escape. Fifty miles away, one rifles are training the Green Eagles on how to counter IS's use of human shields. In particularly in the urban environment, it's really important that wherever you look, your rifle looks as well. So when you come through a doorway, instead of just looking left and right, if you look, your weapon goes. 
At no point do you want to expose the doorway, otherwise someone inside will see you. This is the most dangerous environment that you can operate in, going through buildings. There's so many blind corners, it gives massive advantage to the people in there defending. So you've got to be confident, you've got to be assured of yourself. The second you hesitate in a doorway or you go around a corner without someone following you, that's when mistakes will happen. Bash. And so now you're covering this door, yeah? Ibrahim and the Green Eagles have now finished their training. They will be sent to liberate Bashika on the edge of Mosul. Uh, we have become quite good friends. Let's go, you're losing. you're losing! Every day when we're training, he's always the first one there, immaculately turned out, working the hardest. Go. He's clearly very proud and wants to do very well. So it is going to be slightly strange him going off uh, into the battle and us staying here. Uh, and not necessarily knowing exactly what's going on. As areas surrounding East Mosul are liberated, the coalition and Iraqi army face a new set of problems. Each town and city have been liberated out to the east of Mosul, absolutely riddled with improvised explosive devices, thousands upon thousands of them. You know, everywhere, you open your fridge, it detonates. You get in bed, you put your head on the pillow, the pillow detonates. I mean, there are just IEDs riddled everywhere. So it's going to be a very, very major job to clear those devices. أنا مدير ناحية برطلة يعني الدمار إحنا هذا السوق الرئيسي مال البرطلة دمروها تدمير كامل عمل حزين بالمأساة الناس مسيحيين وشباب بقوا هنا وأخذوهم هاي بعد ما شفنا اشتغلنا بس بالشوارع وما رحنا للداخل وخفنا نخاف لاكو عقوات شيء قرايب ينشتل بي داعش قرايب يغضوهم من الجو كانوا بقوق جري قفبوهم دوهم بلو بلوك زار مو يعمل بالبصاف Are they essentially their engineers? Uh, not always. They can be... Some of the courses that we run, they could be search aware. Yes. To help clear IEDs from liberated areas, British engineers are giving another group of Kurdish Peshmerga soldiers specialist training. So you can see there, he's checking with his valent, and he's also keeping his head up, looking for uh, anything else in depth. Corporal Scott Holloway spent months clearing IEDs in Afghanistan. We're using all the experience that we've gained within uh, Afghanistan and Iraq before. Um, we're bringing all of that knowledge across to the Kurds. We're seen as the best in the world, so if people want to use our knowledge, I would be more than happy to part what I know onto them. We teach him um, the gold standard, the best, uh, the best way to, to do everything. However, we know it's not always going to work like that on the ground. So whether they need to adapt that when they're out there is, is down to them on the ground. The man is doing it spot on. So when he tripwire feels, he's doing it correct. And the other thing he's doing, he's looking inside the window, looking if there's any potential <laughs> devices. <laughs> so if there's anyone else doing this, I want to see you do it just like this man. Lieutenant Rashid and his unit have just returned from the front line. Was this all found in the same place? Their mentality is they've always had a, a warrior sort of background. They're always thinking they want to be the, the guy to plant the flag after it's all done, be the hero and the warrior of the day. Um, 
So they're, they're actually quite eager to get back out there and, and show what they're, what they're made of, really. Actually, when they leave here, they are going to go away and do some pretty scary stuff. It's like sending your children off to school. Happy, but also at the same time, you're thinking, oh, what, what could happen in that playground, you know? Anything could happen. <laughs> Weeks after Ibrahim left the British Army, his Green Eagles regiment helped liberate Bashika on the outskirts of Mosul. Now, Ibrahim must ensure all IS fighters and sympathizers have left the town so residents can return home. <laughs> The battle of Bashika was fierce. Ninety Peshmerga soldiers were killed. IS hid in a vast network of tunnels to avoid coalition airstrikes and launch counterattacks behind enemy lines. The Green Eagles have begun to clear the tunnels of IEDs. The Iraqi army says its troops have seized nearly all of the eastern half of Mosul from the self-styled Islamic State. This morning, Iraqi General Talib al-Shagati made the announcement that the army had accomplished its goals in eastern Mosul. It's taken 94 days to liberate half of Mosul. The coalition's new role in the war has been controversial. Independent monitors claimed 1,400 civilians have been killed in coalition airstrikes. We will do everything in our power to defeat Daesh, kill Daesh on the field of battle without causing any civilian casualties. But regrettably, in some instances, there will be civilian casualties. If we did nothing, there'll be a great deal more civilian casualties because Daesh are killing the civilian population on a daily basis. So there's no, there's no sort of really easy way around this. The cost of fighting IS in Iraq has been enormous.
As the battle for West Mosul continues, four rifles are coming to the end of their tour. Salam. 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 See you later. Doesn't matter where you go in the world, Instagram always counts. I'm proud to say that I'm out here representing my country. While it is frustrating and we want to go out there and find ISIS and do the job ourselves, if we did that, chances are some of the boys might not come home. So it is really good knowing we are going to be going home together. Boss, can you take a photo? I'll, uh, I'll get one from a bit further back. So get the, get the whole plane in there. That's better. <laughs> Ready? Got you. Al-Assad Air Base. Front line of defence against Daesh and a good photo opportunity. Armed forces change, hasn't it? Like, the days of going out and finding the enemy and destroying the enemy, such as ISIS, for reasons above our pay grade, that doesn't happen anymore. I don't know if you speak to my family, they'd much rather me do this than go through building to building in Mosul. I don't think the public back home, I don't think they'd want us to have another Afghan campaign either, would they? Nine times out of ten, when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning, you, you don't feel like you're helping anyone back home, but when you really think about it, yeah, yeah, you probably are. Most annoying things over the 50 cow are not being able to use it. <laughs> Sitting there, toying with you. I think the difficulty from a soldier's perspective with the sort of campaigns we get involved in today is that there's no clean cut victories. It's not like you know, the Falklands War, where you know, the flag flies over Stanley and, and the war is won. There's no, there's no kind of winning or losing, per se. And uh, yeah, that's, that makes our, our lives harder. British soldiers are on the front line of a new Cold War. How many Russians are across the border? 100,000 odd? Yeah, a lot. The Russians were pushing a, an agenda that said that the NATO troops were arriving and were raping people. Defending a country under serious threat of Russian invasion. The Estonians genuinely think that an attack is imminent. The series continues next Wednesday at 9. Next tonight here on BBC Two, the latest boardroom evictee spills the beans. In The Apprentice, you're fired. <laughs>